this is your pastor. And in the words of the Apostle Paul, I thank my God in all remembrance of you. Church is really no other way to say it than to just say it. I miss you and I thank God for you. You know, I was thinking the other day in light of everything that's taking place in our world right now, that sometimes God allows you and I to go through tragedy and adversity in an effort to bring out the best in us. Because the truth of the matter is, tragedy has a way of bringing out the best and unfortunately, the worst in people. I mean, think about it, it really shows us what we are made of. I'm even thinking about my daughter, Kaylin, right now and how when she was much smaller, she would like to bounce her rubber ball inside the house. And I remember vividly one day she was bouncing her ball and she came up to me and she said, Daddy, look, the harder you throw it down, the higher it bounces back. And that was so true because if you throw down a plate, it breaks apart. If you throw down a sandbag, it just thumps to the ground and stays there. However, if you throw down a ball, the harder you throw it down, the higher it bounces back. And for some reason this week, I thought about that. I thought about the plate. I thought about the sandbag and I thought about that rubber ball. And I said to myself, some people, when they are thrown down, they break apart like the plate. And then others, when they are thrown down, they stay down like the sandbag. However, for the child of God, when we are thrown down, we bounce back even higher. And that's what I wanted to encourage somebody with who's tuning in right now. I just wanted to remind you, in spite of everything that's going on in our world right now, you will bounce back. Now, how do I know that? I know that because tragedy has a way of showing us what we are really made of. And the psalmist said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So I'll bet you be encouraged on the day. Now church, I need your prayer for support right now. We all know that prayer is critical during this season and I'm inviting God into every aspect of this health crisis. So I'm asking each and every one of you to take a few moments out of your day just to say a special prayer for the church. And I'm talking about the big C now, the universal church because the church needs prayer. Remember in times past when the world was at its worst, the church was always at its best. And right now it's time for the church to be the church. Therefore, we need to pray for the church. Also, I'm encouraging you to pray for our local church, the Olivet Church. Pray for our elders and deacons and staff and ministry leaders. Pray for our entire membership. Pray for me as your pastor. I need your prayers right now. Those of us who are pastors, we've never pastored through a pandemic before. So I'm asking that you would pray for us and be patient with us as God lead us in leading you. Also pray for our governmental leaders, both national and local. Pray for our health professionals, our first responders, grocery store workers, sanitation workers, truck drivers, Listen, we believe here at the Olivet Church where there is much prayer, there is much power. You can even join us each morning at 6 a.m. for corporate prayer as we invite the presence of God to help us during this pandemic. I want to also encourage you to give online at theolivetchurch.org or through PushPay by texting Olivet Give to 77977 or by mailing your offering to P.O. Box 143298, Fayetteville, Georgia, 30214. Remember, your generous gifts are vital to the health and the advancement of this church and ministry. It really allows us to fulfill the vision that God has placed before us. So I appeal to you on today to give to this ministry. Remember, each and every Sunday, I'm streaming live at 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. via Facebook and on our website. So be sure to invite your friends and your family to tune in and worship with us as we lift up the name of Jesus Christ together. Also, use one of these hashtags that you see on your screen right now to keep the conversation going because we want to stay connected with you during this time. 
Now, if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, or if you're looking for a church home or just need prayer during these difficult and trying times, I welcome you once again to go on our website at theolivetchurch.org and follow the special prompts. And one of our ministers and staff persons will be more than happy to reach out to you and pray for you and talk to you more about the Olivet Church. Brothers and sisters, I'm praying for you today and I encourage you to take all necessary precautions. I even appeal to you to be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. I'm Pastor Robinson, and as always, I see you in your future and you're looking much better than you're looking right now. Grace and peace. Praise the Lord, everybody, wherever you are this morning. Can you put your hands together and let's give our God great praise because he's good. And we can say there is no God like God. Come on. Hey, if you know it's no God like ours, put your hands together wherever you are. Lift your voices in the sanctuary. Your house can be your sanctuary. Your car is your sanctuary. Wherever you are, let's lift him up today. Yes, Lord. There's nobody like you. And we lift you up today. And we magnify you today. And we give your name great glory and great honor and great praise. Hallelujah. These are the days of Elijah. Carrying the word of the Lord. These are the days of his servant. Moses, righteousness being restored. And these are the days of Rahab. Your fields are all white in the world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard preparing the word of the Lord. Say, behold, he comes riding on a cloud. Oh! 
up your mouth and give God glory. Hallelujah. 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 We can say he's our good God. He's our great God. And there is nobody like him. Come on, can you take this time and can you make a space of worship for your God, for the God that keeps healing, for the God that keeps making ways, for the God that keeps opening doors, for the God that keeps touching your mind, for the God that keeps keeping your family. Come on, make space for him today. Yes, Lord. And we can say that you've been good. You are good and you will be good. That's our testimony today. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you and we lift you. And we say it's nobody like you. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Lord, you are good. You've been so good, Lord, you are good. You've been better than good. I can't praise you enough. I owe you my life. Can't praise you enough. Even if the try goes, you've been yeah. so good to me. so good yeah Hallelujah. lord you are good you've been better than good i can't praise you enough i owe you my life can't praise you enough even if i'm trying because you've been so good Let's sing it. Oh, say, Lord, you are good. You've been so good. You've been so good. Lord, you are Lord, good. You are good. Yeah, yeah. You've been better than good. I can praise you. I owe you my life. I owe you my life. Can't praise you enough. Yeah. Even if I try. So say it to him. Our testimony today. So many doors you've opened, so many ways you've made, so many times you heal. Come on, let's lift that up to the Lord. Say, so many doors, so many doors you opened, so many ways, so many ways you made, so many times you heal. Come on, let's lift it up one more time. Say it. Say, so many doors, so many doors you opened, so many ways. Better than good to me.
better than good to me. Our voice. You've been, yeah, so good. Come on, say it. You've been so good. So good. You've been, You've been so good. So good. You've been, been so good. So good. You've been, been so good. Yes, you have. Lord, we worship you today. We honor your presence in this place. We thank you for being good. We thank you for so many doors that you have opened. We thank you for so many ways that you have made. We thank you for being better than good. We thank you for being good to us and faithful to us even when we were unfaithful to you. We thank you for how you keep saying good morning to us even when we fail to say good night to you. God, you've been so good to us. You have been better to us than we've been to you. So for this, Lord, we say thank you. If you don't do another thing for us, you've already done enough for us to praise you for. If you never give us another job, another house, another car, you've already done enough for us to thank you for you've done exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ever ask think or imagine and Lord for this we say thank you now God we ask that you would have your way in this place right now we turn this worship experience over to you we ask that you would move by your power move by your might move by your Holy Spirit Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Melt us. Mold us. Make us. Break us, Lord. Fill us. And then use us. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. And Lord, we give you all the praise. We give you all the honor and all the glory. And it's in the marvelous and matchless and majestic name of Jesus the Christ we pray. And every child of God who's tuning in right now said amen, amen, and amen. Wherever you are, can you just give God a hand of praise? Come on, can you just give God a hand of praise? This is still the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank God for his goodness on today and we just thank God for being an awesome God, an on time God, a God who can meet any and every need. And just let me encourage you for just a moment by telling you no matter what we're going through right now, God is too wise to make a mistake. He's too right to be wrong. He's too big to be small. And even in the midst of calamity, we say yes to his will and we say yes to his way. And God, we give you all the praise. We still give you all the praise. And I'm going to ask that you would just share with me for a moment as I focus our attention to the 23rd division of Psalm Psalm 23, before I learn my ABCs, before I learn, now lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. The first thing that my mother and my father taught me was the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. 
He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to talk about for just a few moments today, moving from worry to trust. Moving from worry to trust. God bless you. A young boy was asked to recite the 23rd Psalm during a Sunday school program. However, the nervous young man forgot the opening line of the Psalm. So he came up with a contemporary, unfamiliar version. And he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not worry about it. In other words, he missed the exact words of the psalm, but he caught the exact sense of the psalm. And that is, if the Lord is your shepherd, you really have nothing to worry about. And that's what I want to talk about for just a few moments, moving from worry to trust. The story is told of a man who was so worried that he would die of cancer one day because cancer was so prevalent in his community. And he worried about it for so long, nearly 30 years, until all of a sudden he died of a heart attack. And the question is, should you and I be concerned about our health? Absolutely. Should you and I do the best we can to remain safe and healthy during these critical and unprecedented times? Of course we should. However, the lesson on today is simply this. After we've done everything we can, we have to turn it over to the Lord in prayer and let him do everything that we can. And that's the first thing that I believe this, this text is trying to teach us on today, that those of us who trust in the Lord can live with the confidence and assurance that the Lord is watching over us. Not only is the Lord watching over us, but I also believe that this text is trying to show us what the Lord is watching over and first and foremost, the text seems to suggest that the Lord is watching over our physical needs. If you notice, David says in verse number two, he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. In other words, the first thing that the Lord does for those who trust in him is he provides nourishment meaning sheep are not designed to hunt down or dig up their food. They are not built that way. Therefore, sheep need a shepherd to find pastures for them to graze. And watch now, it must be green pastures because hungry sheep have the potential to satisfy their hunger in the wrong places. Therefore, the shepherd, the faithful shepherd, leads his sheep, the Bible says, to green pastures and once he leads them to green pastures the Bible says it's there he makes them lie down and I discovered Olivet that the shepherd does this because the shepherd knows what's best for the sheep <laughs> the shepherd knows the road ahead and the shepherd knows that tired and hungry sheep will not make the journey so he makes the sheep lie down, the text says, in green pastures. And church, I discovered that this is how the Lord even works sometimes in our own lives. Sometimes he makes us lie down in green pastures. 
In other words, when we become frantic like the sheep, when we become worried and can't find any inner peace, the shepherd makes us lie down in green pastures. But not only that, not only does the Lord make us lie down in green pastures, but he also provides refreshments. I want you to see this. He provides nourishment, but then the Bible also suggests that he provides refreshments. In other words, once the sheep have satisfied their hunger and renewed their strength in those green pastures, they need something to drink. So the text says the shepherd leads them beside still waters. As a matter of fact, just as the pastures must be green, the waters must be still. See, the reality is when thirsty sheep wade into running waters too long, their wool becomes wet and heavy. And understand, this causes the sheep to lose their balance and fall into the water and potentially drown. However, the good shepherd dams up the brook transforming rushing waters into a quiet stream so that the sheep can get a drink in still waters. And Olivet, aren't you glad on this Sunday morning that when your life was rushing and roaring out of control like the sheep, when you were right on the verge of sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, aren't you glad on this Lord's day that God led you beside the still water? And that's the first thing that I believe this text is tailored to teach us that the Lord watches over our physical needs. Even in the midst of a job loss, he's still watching over our physical needs. Even in the midst of a declining economy, God is still watching over our physical needs. Even in the midst of a government on the verge of shutting down, I want to remind you on this Sunday morning that God is still watching over your physical needs. He makes us, the Bible says, lie down in green pastures and leads us beside the still waters. But, but not only does the Lord watch over our physical needs, but according to the text, he also watches over our spiritual needs. If you notice there in verse number three, it says, he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, now, in this verse, David drops the shepherd and the sheep metaphor in order to make it real clear that the Lord can also be trusted to take care of our spiritual needs. And all of that, the way that the Lord watches over our spiritual needs are is first and foremost, he provides restoration when we stray away. Let me say that again. I say he provides restoration when we stray away. Notice in verses 1 and 2, David describes how good his shepherd is. He describes how the shepherd fully satisfies every need for nourishment and refreshment. However, David says, listen, there are still times when the sheep stray away. And David says, listen, this is not a negative reflection on the shepherd because the shepherd is unceasingly good. He says the shepherd is not just good some of the time, but the shepherd is good all of the time. But, but, but watch now, even though the shepherd is good, sheep are still sheep and because they are still sheep there are times when the sheep look for nourishment in barren places that there are times when the sheep look for nourishment in polluted wells but but the good news is i love it the good news is the good shepherd does not leave us nor forsake us but instead the bible says he restores our soul M meaning he leaves watch now the, the 99 
other sheep and then goes looking for the one that is lost. And can I ask you a question on the day, Olivet? I don't know how you feel about it, but aren't you glad that Jesus one day went looking for you? I mean, can you testify right now that when you got saved, it wasn't because you just stumbled in the church, but Jesus came to where you were and he was looking for you. I believe somebody can even testify who's tuning in right now that you were in a bad situation, but Jesus came looking for you. You were in a bad relationship, but Jesus came looking for you. You were in a bad predicament, but Jesus came looking for you. Even when you were out there doing your own thing, Jesus came looking for you, and you ought to thank God on this Sunday morning that when you were too mean to live, but you wasn't fit to die, Jesus came looking just for you. He came looking for you. But, but not only does the Lord provide, watch now, restoration when we stray away. But, but according to this text, the Lord also provides guidance to keep us from straying away. No, no, notice verse 3 says, he restores my soul. He, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, now church, th there are three assurances in this particular statement. For, first of all, it, it tells us that God faithfully leads those who trust in him. And the even better news is, is that he leads us in paths of righteousness. That's number two. In other words, he leads us in straight paths. Another way to say it is, we can trust God this Sunday morning to do what is right. But, but then the best news of all, and I hope you hear me today, is number three, is that God leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In the book, A Shepherd's Look at, at Psalm 23, uh, W. Philip Keller tells how a, a shepherd would raise sheep and then lead them to the marketplace to sell, to sell their fleece. But he says that the shepherd would choose his path carefully because if the shepherd showed up with a wounded or maimed sheep, it would hurt his profits. Therefore, he had to lead his sheep in straight paths to the marketplace. And at some point, church, the merchants would no longer examine the sheep, but they would just accept the sheep on the reputation of the shepherd for his name's sake. And all of it, I discovered that this is how the Lord leads us sometime. He leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In other words, his reputation is at stake. His word is on the line. So he leads us in straight paths because if he doesn't, he makes himself look bad. The wife of Albert Einstein was once asked if she understood her husband's theory of relativity. And her response was, no, I don't, but I know my husband. And if he says it's true, you can trust him. And I'll bet that's all I came to tell you on today. If God said it, you can take him at his word. In other words, we can trust God to do what is right. Meaning we can trust him this morning with our finances. We can trust him with our future. We can trust him with our families. We can even trust him with our health. Why? Because David says he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In other words, his reputation is on the line. But, but not only does the Lord watch us over those who trust in him, but according to the text, the Lord walks with those who trust in him. No, no, notice the, the first verse, the first three verses of Psalm 23 declare that God is worthy of our trust because he is good, faithful, and sufficient. Let me say that again. God is worthy of our trust because he is good, faithful, and sufficient. But then when you get to verse 4, the scene shifts, meaning David is no longer in green pastures or by still waters, but now he's in a dark valley. However, notice David's confidence in God does not change while in the valley. 
verse 4 says even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me now now church when when you read that that there is both bad news and good news here the, the bad news is your trust in God will not keep you from the valleys of life that, that, that's the bad news see let me tell you on this morning problems just don't go away because you know the shepherd <laughs> See, see, a whole lot of people are confused right now because they hooked up with the shepherd thinking that their life was all of a sudden going to be problem free only to discover that they still have some of the same problems that they had before they hooked up with the shepherd. See, see the difference is, is not that you now have a struggle free life, but the difference is you now have a manager who can help you manage what you could not handle on your own and David admits almost reluctantly that there are times in life when he has to go through the valley but this is not an indictment against the goodness of the shepherd see, see David here in the text I love it it is not confessing that he's in the valley because he strayed away as a matter of fact, in verse 3, David clearly says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But, but then there are times, church, when the righteous ways of God require that the shepherd lead his sheep through the valley of the shadow of death. And that phrase, the shadow of death, is really a poetic way of describing deep darkness. It refers to being in a valley that is so dark that it seems like the shadow of death has hidden the sunshine. In fact, in fact, this phrase can even apply to death itself. But it's also meant to describe, hear me today, any dark situation where you cannot see your way through. For example, a sick bed can be the valley of the shadow of death. Bankruptcy can be the valley of the shadow of death. Foreclosure can be the valley of the shadow of death. The loss of a business can be the valley of the shadow of death. Unemployment, the death of a loved one, even going through a divorce can be the valley of the shadow of death. And I repeat, hear me today, your trust in God will not keep you from going through the valleys of life. But, but church, if you don't remember anything else I say on this morning, remember this, it's only a shadow. <laughs> That, that, that's what I stopped by to tell you on today. Those of you who are tuning in right now, it's only a shadow. And I want to encourage you today and tell you that wherever there's a shadow, there's also a light. And if you can just manage to turn your back on the shadow and look at the light, you can make it through your valley season. And right now, I need you to know that this nation and this world is in a valley season but if we can just focus on the light the songwriter said it this way the songwriter said walk in the light beautiful light come where the dew drops of mercy shine bright shine all around us by day and by night Jesus the light of the world D David says here in the text he says listen it's only a shadow you're going through the valley and the operative word there is through in other words David says listen don't send me any mail to this address because by the time it gets here I'll be gone because I'm just going through and I need to encourage somebody right now who's going through some situations and some circumstances this too shall pass if you can hold on and hold out you don't have to be a road scholar to know if you keep on walking through you gonna make it to the other side David says it's only a shadow the renowned Bible commentator John Phillips says it this way the shadow of a dog cannot bite the shadow of a sword cannot kill and the shadow of death cannot harm the child of God 
So here's the good news, even though you and I are living in times right now when we're literally are having to walk through the valley of the shadow of death because of a virus that no one can explain. The good news is our trust in God will keep us from living in fear of the dangers that threaten us in the valley. Timothy says it this way, God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. In other words, fear is just the dark room where negatives are developed. And God wants you and I today to replace fear with trust. A another way to say it is when fear knocks, uh, you got to learn how to let faith answer the door. Let me say that again. I said when fear knocks, you got to let faith answer the door. And I love it because someone said that the acronym for faith is forwarding all issues to heaven. A and that's a good word for somebody who's tuning in right now, especially during these times of uncertainty because so many are experiencing money issues and health issues and family issues and job issues as a result of this global pandemic however the good news is on this Lord's day we can forward all of our issues to the Lord because God is still in control David says I'm not afraid of any evil thing in the valley because my shepherd is with me which brings me to another point and that is the lord is prepared to help you D david says i love it he says even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me now i need you to know quickly that a rod and a staff were the basic equipment that a shepherd carried to take care of his sheep meaning his rod a club was in one hand and his staff a lone stick was in another hand in other words the shepherd did not travel empty-handed and David is saying here, listen, he's saying here in this text, he says, I am comforted. My heart is at ease. I know that everything is going to be all right. Why? Because my shepherd has his rod and his staff. Not, not only that, not only that church, but sometimes when the shepherd would get tired on his journey, when he would get a little weary on his journey, sometimes that shepherd would lean on his staff. And what David is suggesting here right now is that sometimes I get a little weak on my journey. Sometimes I get tired on my journey. Sometimes I want to quit and give up on this journey called life. But David says, I got a shepherd that I can lean on in times of trouble. He says, I got a shepherd I can lean on in times of crisis. I got a shepherd that I can rest on when I'm weary from my journey. That's why the songwriter said, I came to Jesus just as I was. I was weary, worn, and sad, but I found in him a sweet old resting place. And he has made me glad. David says, and I'm getting ready to close, he's prepared to help me. If I can just trust him, if I can just have faith in him, David says he can help me. See, I discovered, church, faith is just like Wi-Fi. It's invisible, but it has the power to connect you to what you need. Let me say that again. I said faith, that's why you got to have it. It's just like Wi-Fi. It's invisible, but it has the power to connect you to what you need. Jesus said it this way. If you have the faith, the size of a grain of mustard seed, you can speak to the mountain, be thou removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. But you got to trust him. But church, not only does the Lord watches over those who trust in him and walks with those who trust in him, but third and final, the Lord welcomes those who trust in him. No, notice that the 23rd Psalm is called the shepherd Psalm because of the beautiful picture that it paints of the shepherd's faithful oversight of the sheep. However, Olivet, there's an actually, there are actually two word pictures in this song. 
meaning in verses 1 through 4, the Lord is described as a good shepherd. But then in verses 5 through 6, the Lord is described as a gracious host. I want you to see this in verse 5, the setting or the scene suddenly shifts. In other words, we're no longer sheep in God's flock, but now we are guests in God's home. And the final verses of the 23rd Psalm testifies to the Lord's generous and continued hospitality. M meaning in verse 5, David says, I love it. He says, listen, thou prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runneth over. Now, now this particular verse describes three ways in which the Lord demonstrates his generous hospitality to those who trust in him but I'll just deal with one for the sake of time David says he says first he says look at my enemies in other words David pictures himself as a guest in the court of a monarch and watch now the host was prepared the, the host has prepared a banquet feast and invited David to the table but I want you to see this, some of David's enemies were at the table too. So David had a decision he had to make. And the decision was, would he flee the presence of his enemies or would he enjoy the hospitality of the host? However, I love it, David chooses to enjoy the hospitality of his host in spite of the presence of his enemies. And church, the binding custom of ancient hospitality at the time of our text required that the host take full responsibility. I'm going somewhere for his guests. So, so literally, David's enemies were not really his enemies, but they were now the enemies of the host. So watch now, if you had a problem with David, I'm going somewhere, you now had a problem with the host. That therefore David was able to enjoy his meal in spite of his enemies because he was confident that the Lord had his enemies under control. That, that's why he says in verse 5, he says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, David was saying, he was saying, listen, my adversary is under control. It, it reminds me, church, it reminds me of, of, of when I was in middle school and, and some days after school, my parents would let me take the martyr train home from school and, and me and some of my classmates, about seven of us, would walk to the train station, Westlake train station to be exact, to catch the train home from school. And, and I remember, I remember church like clockwork, we, we would pass this, this one particular house on our way to the train station and, and out of of nowhere that there would always be this big dog that would jump up out at us and start chasing us I mean Olivet when I tell you we, we would run like everything we could to get out of there I'm talking about with book bags on and lunch boxes swinging in our hands I mean in our minds we were running for our lives and church, this happened, this happened every day for at least three weeks. And you would think, you would think that we would have found a new route home by now. But, but I guess we just like the adrenaline of it all. So, so on one particular day, we walked by that same house. And you know what happened? That dog came running out at us. And you know what we did? We took off running. However, on this particular day, we did something that we had never done before. While we were running, one of our classmates hollered out, stop. So all of us came to a complete halt. And when we stopped, uh, my classmate yelled out again, he's on a chain, he's on a chain, the dog is on a chain. W watch now, out of all of those days, of running from that big dog out of all of those days of being scared of a dog out of all of that time of ducking and dodging the dog we never once stopped long enough to consider that maybe the dog was on a chain 
Can I tell you all of that, that the reason why you don't have to worry on this Sunday morning, the reason why you don't have to fret, the reason why you don't have to be afraid of what tomorrow will bring is because the God we serve has this whole situation on a chain. In other words, our problems are on a chain. Our trials are on a chain. Our circumstances are on a chain. Sickness, the coronavirus is on a chain. The government, Senate, Congress, the president, the nation, all of it. I stop by to remind you on today that the God we serve has this whole world on a chain. In other words, he's got the whole world in his hands. I said he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me brother in his hands. He's got you and me sister in his hands. He's got the itty bitty baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. And I need to tell you if he has the whole world in his hands that means he can do something about it in other words he has it all under control that's why you need to know today whatever you're going through it's in god's hands he can do something about it you can be not dismayed whatever be tithe because god will take care of you beneath his wings of love abide i need you to know today that he will take care of you amen the whole world in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands he's got you and me brother in his hands he's got you and me brother in his hands he's got you and me brother in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands come on sing that he's got the whole world Yeah. Uh-huh. 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we commemorate how he died for us how he went to Calvary to save us from our sins so that we could have a life and have it more abundantly Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed we're delivered and we are set free as we prepare to commune right where you are right in your home wherever you are if you want to join in with us as we partake of the Lord's Supper on the night that our Lord and Savior Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat the all of it. In the same manner, he took the cup and said, this is my blood which is shed for the remission of sins that represents the new covenant that I leave with you take drink ye all of it as often as ye eat of this body and drink of this cup he says you show the Lord's death until he comes he says as often as you do this do this in remembrance of me oh the blood Oh, the blood, the blood done signed my name. Oh, the blood, oh, the blood, the blood done signed my name. Oh, the blood, Jesus' blood, the blood done signed my name all the blood done sign my name oh at calvary at calvary that's where the blood had signed my name it was at calvary Calvary, oh, oh, the blood, it signed my name. Calvary, Calvary, that's where the blood signed my name. Oh, the blood done signed my name. Oh, his precious blood, Jesus' precious blood, was the blood that signed my name. Oh, it was Jesus' precious blood, oh, his blood that signed my name. Jesus' blood. His precious blood, oh, his blood that signed my name. All oh, the blood done signed my name. Oh, 
Thank you, Jesus, for the blood, for the blood that signed my name. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I know it was your blood that signed my name. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that signed my name. All oh, the blood that signed my name. Oh, oh, oh the blood, the blood, the blood done signed. My name, all the blood, all the blood. I know it was the blood that signed my name. All the blood, thank you for the blood, the blood that signed my name. All the blood. Sign my name. Amen. Thank you. We want to thank you, Olivet, for tuning in and worshiping with us. And friends, we pray that you were blessed through the ministering of music or through the spoken word. Listen, if you're looking for a church home to unite with, we want to welcome you to the Olivet Church where families fellowship in Fayetteville where the doors swing back on welcome hinges. If you want to unite with this particular ministry, all you have to do is just go on, log on to our website and you will see information there uh, telling you how you can connect with us. Also, if you want to give to this ministry, and I'm encouraging all of our members, Olivet members, I'm encouraging, encouraging you to give to this ministry to so into the ministry that has been a blessing to you in your tithes and in your offering. There are several ways to give, and you can see that on your screen. Amen. But we love you. Let me say this. As your pastor, I need you to know I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. I see you in your future, and you're looking much better than you're looking right now. As we go to God together in prayer, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father in heaven, we just thank you right now. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the illumination of your word. We thank you for the revelation of your word. We thank you for the power of your word. We pray right now for those under the sound of my weak voice who are struggling in their finances, those who are struggling in their health, those who are struggling with their families, God. I speak right now that you would be with them, that you would stand by them, that you would remind them that you are the good shepherd, the shepherd who leads them even in the valley of the shadow of death. Now, God, we ask that you would cover us, cover us from all sickness, cover us from all disease. We pray for nurses and doctors and those who are in the healthcare profession. We speak right now that you would dispatch your angels around them to protect them from danger seen and unseen danger. Now to him who's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. And all of God's children said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. God bless you. See you next week. Bless you. Hi, I'm Pastor Robinson. Good morning, Olivet. We're here today with a good friend and my Morehouse brother and also my personal doctor, Dr. Miles Johnson. And I asked Dr. Miles Johnson to come and just share with us a, a few things concerning the coronavirus. As you know, right now we are in a pandemic and there's so much going on, so much information is out there about 
what to do and what not to do. And so I asked him to come and just share with us briefly about some things we need to do concerning this particular virus. So let me first of all say thank you, Miles, for taking time out of your schedule to be here. Oh, it's been my pleasure and I love to do it. First and foremost, tell me what medical field that you're in and also tell us uh, where you're located. Okay, medical field, I do family medicine and I'm located in Griffin and as well as in Atlanta. All right, before we go any further, this will be a great time to tell everybody what's the best church in the land and the best pastor. Of course, the best church in the land is the Olivet Church, the best pastor, oh, Dr. <laughs> William Holmes Robinson. Very good, but that, that's good. I mean, I, I know it's kind of hard for a Q to give a cap of his props, but it's all right, it's all right. We, we'll get through that. But Miles, let me, let me say this. Um, I, I'm, I'm right now deeply concerned because I don't think um, society is taking this serious enough. T tell us how serious this, this epidemic or pandemic really is. Well, to be honest, the reason why it's so serious is because we've never seen anything like this before. We've had other viruses and other outbreaks, but they've usually always been contained to certain areas. Whether it's in the U.S. or outside of the U.S., they've been pretty much contained, so they were easier to control and take care of. Whereas the, the, but the coronavirus is worldwide. It's spread everywhere, and that's why they're now calling it a pandemic as opposed to an epidemic because it affects and touches all parts of the world. And that's what makes this virus more, much more serious than some of the other things that we've uh, come across because it spreads so widespread. So would that kind of be the difference in it being a virus versus a flu? Well, the thing is, the symptoms are almost similar mm -hmm. because the coronavirus is a virus and the flu is also a virus. But the difference is, is usually with the flu, you get the body aches, you get, you know, some fever, some chills, and usually your symptoms rest at home and they kind of go away. The main issues with the coronavirus is basically you have some of those same symptoms, but you also have a productive cough. You may have a lot of shortness of breath and also it's a very debilitating illness, which, you know, initially we were thinking that it only affected our elderly population. Now we know that it affects people of all age groups from adults as well as children. Okay. Let me, let me ask you this, Miles. What's, what's the difference between an allergy or the coronavirus? And I'm, I'm going to ask you this because, you know, I think sometimes we're getting paranoid. And I know I sneezed the other day and first thing I thought about, oh my God, do I have the coronavirus? So what's, what's kind of the, the difference, the allergy symptoms versus the coronavirus? Tell us, can, can you make a distinction with that? Yeah, because we have to really be careful to distinguish the two because right now, this time of the year, it's very high pollen count. It's very easy for people with allergies to have the watery eyes, which is known to happen, the runny nose, cough and congestion. But the main thing that differentiates it from the coronavirus is you can have those same things, but the coronavirus, you're going to have the fever. You're going to have the chills. You're going to have the shortness of breath. And when you do have a cough, it's going to be a productive cough. And it's, like I said, it's very debilitating. You have increased weakness. But the main thing with that is to alert anyone that you're around, preferably in advance, that you do have symptoms of allergies and you are taking medication for your allergies. So if you do cough or sneeze in their presence, they kind of been pre-warned and they kind of won't jump to conclusions. So those are the main differences. Okay. How does, how does the coronavirus spread? The coronavirus spread is the primary through respiratory. When I say respiratory, I mean droplets. Sometimes when you cough, they get into the environment. When you sneeze, you may sneeze into your hand and then start touching other objects because on objects, the coronavirus can last anywhere from up to two days to a week. Whereas direct contact, usually it's uh, you have to be within six feet of someone to actually get contact. So the main thing that we really, really want to reiterate is taking the precautionary measures that's involved. Uh, number one, if all, stay at home. All right. The main thing is staying at home. Okay. All right. Let, let me let me ask you this, Miles, because I know your your faith is strong, um, and I know you you, you you trust God. But but how do you, as a medical professional, um, how, how do you deal with, with being a medical professional as well as a Christian? How do you kind of balance the two when you're talking to people or when you're explaining this particular pandemic? How do you, how do, you do that? Well, with me, there really is no balance. I don't have to balance the two because it's all one and the same. Because God, I believe in each and every day, I'm sure that 
of course, there are members of Olivet do as well. And he's also given me the education and the knowledge to use what he's given me to in the medical field to use medications, to use common sense, and to want to be able to take care and help my fellow man. So God gave me all of my tools, and therefore I'm using the tools that God gave me to help everyone else. Amen. Amen. All right. So if, if someone thinks, if, if someone thinks, Mal, that they have the coronavirus, do they just go to the hospital? Or, I mean, what, what steps do they take? The first and foremost, what you should do is contact your primary care physician. Kind of get on the phone, and what they'll do is call a triage, meaning they'll ask you some questions, get an idea of what kind of symptoms you're having, and things of that nature. If they feel that you have uh, severe symptoms, then they will definitely have you go to the emergency room. But if they feel that your symptoms can be limited at home, you're taking maybe medication to help reduce the fever and getting rest and increasing the fluid intake, the most common thing they will tell you is to stay home, stay away from others, kind of self-isolate yourself until you, know, you start feeling better. But the main thing that you don't want to do is automatically just run to the emergency room because they're overcrowded, they aren't going to really help you. They don't have a lot of the testing that people think that the emergency rooms have. So therefore, the best thing, contact your primary physician and kind of give them the information and go from there. So, Miles, what's the best way to protect yourself? Now, you know, I, I want to be safe. We all want to be safe. Mm -hmm. uh, but is it, is it overkill for me to have a mask and gloves on everywhere I go? I mean, you know, if I go in the grocery store, do I wear gloves and a mask? I, definitely, I would do that if I'm getting on an airplane. But I mean, what, how, how far to go with that? Well, a lot of the things that people you see nowadays with masks and gloves, mm -hmm. it is a bit of an overkill. Okay. Because, you know, from even looking at the, the media and looking at what's going out there in the supply and demand, a lot of those gloves, a lot of those masks can be really used for people who really need them the most, meaning the immunocompromised or people who work in the health care. So really to prevent yourself is the social isolation. Mm -hmm. And then when you do go out in public is basically maintaining that at least five feet five to six feet from other individuals, making sure when you cough, sneeze, you know, you cover yourself, you use a tissue after you sneeze and throw the tissue in the garbage. And also you have to really wash and disinfect your hands. Meaning when you go into the store, you're touching items in the store. When you go to the gas station, you're touching the gas pump. Somebody may have touched it before you. So the main thing that you want to keep doing is sanitize and sanitize it, whether you're using soap and water to wash your hands or using sanitizers. But the main thing that I'll reiterate is, number one, stay at home. But when you have to go out for essential items or doctor's appointments or things of that nature, make sure you wash your hands whenever you touch items and always stay five to six feet from other individuals. Good. And, I, and, I, and you, you, you reiterated twice, stay at home. So <laughs> this, this is not the time to go on spring break to the beach and hanging out with the friends. This is just not the time to do yeah. that. There's not the time to do that. No matter what you see on the media as far as people going to Miami and going for spring break, that's one of the worst things you can possibly do because that helps spread the coronavirus to all different populations and also to different age groups. So the main thing is, you know, I know it's rough. I know it's hard. Matter of fact, I have a daughter at home who <laughs> kind of grilling me now saying how bored she is. She needs things to do. She needs to be entertained. Her mother and I try, but I know we're not any substitute for our friends. Right. But we have to keep re reiterating with her the importance of the coronavirus and how is spread and how it can affect others and also how whomever she affects they can take that home and affect other people right. and we never know who someone has in their household meaning elderly people with multiple medical conditions and things of that nature so i hate to say it and I, there's no people don't want to hear it. spring break is out yeah it's, it's you know and uh, the wrap. thing is yeah, it's a wrap so social media netflix yeah you know maybe your best friend hulu you know <laughs> amazon prime <laughs> That's going to be the way of life for yeah, a minute. for a minute. Okay. And All that's right. one of the main reasons why we're doing this, for, even for church, we're trying to keep yeah. people at home, yeah. and we're streaming and trying to keep them educated, but still giving the, the good word of the Lord with us and everything. Right. So if we can stay at home, you can stay at home. All right. <laughs> well, Miles, I, you know, you as, as a member, you, you, you've just been an outstanding member here at the Olivet Church, and you've been a, a great friend to me. And um, as my personal doctor, you've looked out for me over the years. So I want to thank you personally for your medical expertise. I want to thank you for just taking time and sharing with the, the Olivet family as well as the viewing audience on some things we should and should not do. Olivet, I want to encourage you to take all the necessary precautions that you need to take during this time. As Dr. Miles Johnson said, take this seriously. 
This is not something to be taken lightly. However, we don't have to walk around in fear because God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So we have to trust God during these difficult times. We have to keep the faith and we have to let the faith keep us. I'm Pastor William Holmes Robinson, and as always in closing, I see you in your future and you're looking much better than you're looking right now. Grace and peace.